Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. For a conversation of the central banks and bankers committee move against loan defaulters, we're now being joined by Shegun Agbaje, the managing director of Guaranteed Trust Bank. Welcome to the program, sir. Good morning. Thank yes, you. Emily, uh, welcome to the morning show. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, this uh, new clause that uh, the CBN is uh, proposing as a way of uh, ensuring financial stability uh, in Nigeria, uh, what is the benchmark? What, in your view, is the model for this? Or is this just an innovation? And how is it different? How is it a departure, if it is in any way, from the credit management, credit risk management system that we already have in place? Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to believe that it's our own homegrown innovation. Um, in other parts of the world, your credit management system and your credit history. I mean, for those who have lived abroad, once your credit is destroyed, you basically can't access credit. So they have that implicit check. Unfortunately, it's taken us years to build this credit history in Nigeria, so you still have a situation where people can owe one bank and borrow from another bank. And so while you're building that credit history and having a proper way of doing a credit check, this is a very, very noble way of getting around it. And essentially what this does, it means that you can't borrow in one bank, abandon the loan, and do business in another. And I mean, I think that clause will help you. So it's not a departure from really what the credit agencies are doing. It's something that would help and will, you would put in place until you get to a point where, you know, the credit agencies and credit ratings and all of those become a lot, lot more effective than they have been. I'm sure this is good news for deposit money banks like yourself, but then what are your thoughts on this CBN instruction of maintaining a 60% um, loan-to-deposit ratio? It's funny. I mean, I really don't think it's that dramatic, and I think the CBN has actually been very good about how they've done it. At the time this was announced, the loan-to-deposit ratio in the industry was 57%. So all people have to grow by 3%. And so I think there's a bit more alarm than reality and you're growing three percent by the end of september and i think for most banks you'll either get very close or there are some banks over it so i think it's been measured in its approach if we had gone from 57 to 80 in three months then you would have had a lot of chaos but i think going from 57 to 60 is manageable you know the the credit clause is good but it doesn't really solve the problem because it seems as though banks just don't get the focus on small businesses right and the constant focus that goes towards debtors it's 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 kind of becoming as though there are stories out there that banks are even getting as far as not only just looking to get back what they need to get back from their debtors but also implicating their debtors for that collateral in certain instances that have been reported what are your thoughts on situations like this and how can banks how can banks start to have more transparency so when they are going after their debtors they're doing it right without any other mishaps in the way well, um, I'm not even sure I agree with you. I think in terms of SME and retail, a lot of your lending is not done around securities, actually done around cash flows. And that the risk you face a lot of times when you have retail credit or SME credit is not really collateral realization. That happens with the corporates. It's the fact that a small business can abandon a loan in one bank and go and do it and do business in another bank because mm. truly there is not a lot of underlying security, which, by the way, is a lot of the criticism as to why banks don't lend to small businesses or retail. But there has been a departure from that in the last few years where people are doing a lot, lot of cash flow lending. And banks like us today, in terms of retail and SME, probably have about 14, 15 percent of our portfolios in that. Mm. Well, what is the mood, you know, um, among members of the uh, Bankers Committee? And, you know, I mean, I can ask you directly as uh, the chief executive of one of the major banks. Do you foresee legal implications? Because when a man takes a loan uh, from a bank, you know, it's like an agreement. There's a sanctity of contract. There are issues about privacy, you know, and it's a direct transaction. Except it's a consolidated loan. Um, do you think this policy will not, you know, bring up a lot of uh, litigation? Because if a man has a right to do business with Bank A, do business with Bank B, you know, uh, are, are you worried the fact that, uh, by the fact that, you know, banks could get slammed with a lot of uh, litigation and depositors, loan defaulters, even insisting on their basic rights? Well, first of all, I think you will have some people who will go that route, quite honestly. But I think that if every single bank has decided to adopt that clause, 
then you really are in a position where if you want to do business with the banks, then you would have to go that route. And then there'll be legal cases. Unfortunately, I'm not a lawyer. And I'm sure legal cases might take five years to determine the final outcome. But if, if as a business you can wait five years, then maybe. But I think most people who are sincere borrowers, who are not chronic defaulters, will probably sign it because the intention was never to take a loan and not pay. But how, how is this you know, going to uh, be different from the options already available to the banks? One, you can seize collaterals, the, the right of set off, you know, uh, rest with the banks. You can negotiate, you can settle, and all that. This looks like uh, cross carpeting, if I may use that word, from one bank to the other. Well, first, the right of set off tends to exist within a bank. So if you have three different accounts and you borrow under one name and you have other accounts, the rights of set-off is kind of restricted to your own environment. Um, I think if you say cross-carpeting, it really isn't, in my own opinion. It's, um, it's a loophole that has existed in the system. I think in most other developed economies, you cannot owe one bank and then be doing business in another bank because your credit history would catch up with you. In Nigeria, unfortunately, because we haven't developed the credit history system properly, people are still able to do that. So this is just a way around it until you get to a point where where your credit goes bad, you're deprived of um, facilities or loans within a banking system, which is what happens everywhere else in the world. I'm going to stay with Dr. Abati's line sure. of talking about the practical impact. Sure. So the whole idea, one imagines, is to boost the real sector. Yes. How would this happen? Well, first of all, you've asked, we've gone to, and I hope I'm not speaking for the regulator, I think that the loan-to-deposit ratio of 60% is just the first move at the end of September. So to boost the real sector, obviously, you've got to lend. And one thing is the banks are probably pushing back, saying, look, if we lend too quickly, our non-performing loans ratios are going to go up. So this is basically something saying, look, you can lend more freely, we will put things in place to make sure that your MPL to total loans ratios don't go bad and that as you grow the loan book, you're not growing the MPLs. And so, and there is no way you can boost the real sector without lending. And so this is just to give the bank some comfort to be able to go out and grow their loan book and not worry too much about the non-performing loans that will happen as a result of that growth. But in this economy, how, how realistic does it then become for lenders to pay back, seeing as the double-digit interest rate that they're going to be paying back on their loans is often way more than they're even getting in their margins on their goods and services? And that's why it doesn't really incentivize a lot of people to look to banks for loans. Or what do you think about this? Um, again, I'm not sure our biggest problem in Nigeria is the double-digit, because you have double-digit inflation anyway. So if you have double-digit inflation, to have real interest rates, you're going to have double-digit interest rates. And a lot of people but you're talking to... it's close to 30%, to, right? No, it's not. Okay, it's what actually is it? Not. Um, we have a protocol called Quick Credit, which you can check, which is 21%, okay. which is 1.7%, 1.75 a month, which is bottom of the pyramid, okay. 20,000, 30,000. That's where I was going to. That a lot of people who borrow out of the informal sector or salary advanced companies are already paying 4 5% a month. And they are not defaulting. So I think that the double-digit interest rate is less the problem with um, growing or access to credit is the bigger issue. I think most small businesses can survive a double-digit interest rate. It's obviously not 30. I think 18, 19, 20. Most small businesses, with the margins they make, will pay back. Well, we're going to go on break in about 60 seconds, but I have a question. You know, sure. Lending is a risk. Of course. And it's the responsibility of the banks to minimize risks. Yeah. Now, the step that, uh, you know, the proposal from the CBA now, uh, isn't it a comment on the diligence, I don't want to use the word uh, competence, of the credit risk officers in the banks? And then, of course, we have credit registries, right? I think we have about three in Nigeria yeah. or so. Uh, is it also not a comment on the inefficiency of uh, uh, credit uh, registries? So instead of worrying about, you know, due diligence with credit risk officers and credit uh, registries, the CBN is trying to uh, adopt this uh, slate of hand. And, you know, don't you think they will need to back it up with law? Because although they talk about the BBN, uh, you really cannot just go after people's accounts uh, without really law, uh, without legal backing. But we'll take a short break, uh, and then when we come back, you can respond to that.
we take a short commercial break now. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Still with us in the in our Lagos studio is Shegun Abadje, the managing director of GT Bank uh, Nigeria. I should add that because he's an international bank. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd ask you a question about credit, the role of credit risk yeah. officers, the role of credit uh, bureaus. bureaus, and whether or not we actually really need a law to back this up if it will work. Okay, I always try to stay away from the things I don't know, which is law. But let me take the two kind of things you've talked about. The credit bureau one's very simple. I mean, I think you need to populate data for the effectiveness of the credit bureaus, and that is happening. You're populating the data. Over time, with the BVNs and data population, you'll be able to go in and look at everything in your credit registry and have total information. On the way to that, you've got to look for a stopgap, which is what I think this is. In terms of credit analysts, yes, um, it's really funny. You can do the best analysis on a credit, and the macros can make that credit go bad. That is one thing that as banks we understand. The one thing that banks don't really like is when you do a proper credit analysis, and it's the character of the borrower that leads to the loan going bad, which means basically you divert the funds after the business starts to go well, in order not to pay the bank, which is willful default. And that is the kind of stuff that this clause will take care of. Where someone's taken a loan in one bank, rather than pay the bank back, they've put the sales proceeds in another bank and they're operating the business properly and running credit balances there. What this will do is it will, it will allow the bank that gave the loan to pull the credit balances in another bank and make good on their obligations. So credit analysis in itself will not avert bad loans if you have a character problem on the part of the borrower. Well, there's the legalese and the niceties of it, but I don't think the point should be lost. The whole point of this, of trying to curtail the activities of what you've just described now, willful default, is to boost the real sector, sure. is to in increase access to funds for MSMEs. So I want to talk to you about NERSA, Microfinance Bank, which is backed by the Bankers Committee. A lot of criticism has been made of that, even though it all sounds all very well and good on paper to be, you know, available in all 774 local governments, 5% interest rates. But people compare it to People's Bank, which failed. What is the distinction here? Um, I think the thing about Nursel, first of all, I, it's, it's done well, could have done better. The difference, though, is that you are using the mainstream banks to do a lot of the disbursements, which can be good or bad. Um, also, you're teaching people in those sorts of localities how to use credit. And so you're basically trying to change a completely different way of life. You're trying to teach people how to use credit. So it has to be a bit of a slow process. And I think that sometimes we're a bit too eager you're trying to teach people who have never been in a formal banking sector, formal lending sector, how to borrow. And I think if you put that in mind and look at the progress that has been made, I think it's been okay. Mm. But, you know, it's interesting because you said the credit analysis is not going to avert bad loans based on the character of certain people, right? But if we look at how we can start developing models of credit rating systems that, okay, let me, let me backtrack a second. Let's look at the, the number of people that are currently owing to banks. It's, it's a minority of people that clearly just had to, managed to get a good cut with a certain banker to get a deal and an access to a loan that the average Nigerian would not be able to get access to. And these are people that do have bad characters, people that are not going to pay back. And then that puts the average Nigerian at a detriment, the average Nigerian trying to get a loan from a bank. So why can't we develop a proper system that can actually look in to actually assessing the characters of certain people that we're giving access to loans to? Because we can avoid this problem if only we went back to the drawing board and we started to develop a model that could work all across the country and all banks could use. Or what is your take on that? Well, First of all, that is what your credit history is everywhere else in the world. Mm. So once you've done, even if you didn't pay your phone bill, you've got mm -hmm. bad credit rating. And once you come to a bank, if I wanted to lend you, once I pull your credit history, yeah. it tells me you're a bad person. Now, I think that there are good people and there are bad people, whether rich, poor, average. Mm. We have a product, and I can tell you, it's not necessarily for rich people, but let me tell you what you will find. You will find some people. It's good because it's still about under 1% default. But look, what do you do when a person has, a, say, a, uh, their salary account with you, which means you have no security, they take a loan from you, 
And a week after they take the loan, they move their salary and cap. That's a character problem. There's no credit model or credit rating index that you can use that would have brought that out. Because this person, up until that day, was servicing their loans, receiving their salaries in your bank. But the minute they get credit for the first time, which is probably not a normal thing in this environment because you probably didn't have phones of yours, you didn't have credit cards or debit cards to build that. So that might have been the first time you accessed credit. So we wouldn't know whether you're a good borrower or a bad borrower. We'd only know that after the fact. But that is the kind of stuff that these clauses will take care of because that person who moved the account, you will be able to pull the credit balances from the bank that they moved that account. But let's talk about duty bank. You are the CEO of GT Bank, and it wouldn't be fair not to ask you one or two questions about your own bank. Now, among the five top-tier banks in uh, Nigeria, uh, GT Bank is a, more or less in terms of assets, uh, but at the same time, you know, does that worry you? And then, of course, the second leg of it is that you also have the smallest number of uh, loan defaulters, particularly delinquent uh, uh, debtors. Uh, what is the framework, the internal framework or strategy that you have in place to ensure this? So two le a two-legged question. Well, let me first answer the first question. Um, we're not worried about size at GT Bank. It's not even one of our objectives. We look at scale. Because at the end of the day, what are the strategic objectives and what does a shareholder really want? You want someone to maximize value, shareholder value. You want profit. You're not really bothered about size. So when we look at our parameters and you look at guaranteed trust, as of today, at least at half year, we're the most profitable bank in the country. We have the highest ROE in the country. We have the highest ROA. We have the lowest cost to income ratio. That is what should concern a shareholder. We have the highest share price. So fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth, size really doesn't matter. What matters is scale and the returns to shareholders and shareholder value. So when we sit in a little room like this, we never concern ourselves with size. It's not one of the parameters we look at. Um, in terms of what we do for loan default, you know, we could be a little better. I just explained some things that we're doing here. Of course, we like to keep our MPLs low, but we are ready to take on some MPLs to help grow our lending business, especially consumer credit and retail credit, which has become quite a focus for us. Because truthfully, you cannot grow an economy without growing SME and retail. Well, speaking of concerns, or otherwise, depending on your answer, GTB is present in nine African countries and is doing well, apart from in East Africa. What are your plans to strengthen your position there? Acquisitions or other investments? What interventions do you have in mind? <laughs> exactly. East Africa, God, I've got to be truthful. It's tr East Africa, a, it's, a tr it's been a tricky market for us. East Africa, going into East Africa, in my opinion, is like coming to Nigeria. If you come into Nigeria as a tier three bank, you're really going to struggle because the big banks control, just like you said, the five banks you mentioned control in Nigeria about 60 to 70 percent of banking business. The situation is similar in East Africa. So when you come into East Africa as a small bank, you're going to struggle unless you can scale up. Um, we will have to scale up in East Africa. Fortunately, it's not a Shegwa Agbaje loan decision. It will be a board decision. But I really think that for us to be successful in East Africa, we're to scale up, like you said, either by doing an acquisition or doing a merger of some sort. But we definitely have to scale up in East Africa. Notice I never want to be the biggest, but I think you must always have enough scale to do good business. Absolutely. And speaking of scale, fintechs all around the world are just targeting the unbanked and making sure that they can give the unbanked access to loans through technology. And looking at Africa, a majority of people are also unbanked. So what is a bank like GCB doing to look at models like this to try and implement into their system so they're not left behind when the rest of the world just moves in the direction of no cards, moving on to tech and fintech for all of our banking? Quick credit is fintech. <laughs> Quick tech is two clicks. Essentially, what is fintech? It's just borrowing on platforms and doing everything outside of a banking hall. And for any smart bank, I'm one of those people who's not threatened by fintechs, actually. I think innovation, fintechs are creating payment platforms, banks are capable of creating payment platforms. And as a bank, what you just have to start to do is to start to think more like a fintech. And that's what we're doing. That's why when we're launching a lot of retail products and a lot of retail lending products, we are launching them online where you can just access Brilliant. them on your phone. Well, a good point about financial inclusion. But let me 
take you back to the uh, original conversation sure. about credit clause. Do you think uh, the credit risk clause, do you think it's sustainable? Do you foresee a situation whereby people will be discouraged from taking loans or a situation where people will find loopholes? Because if I borrow from you, right, I could uh, split my accounts, split my identity, split my BBN, use different names, and then, of course, frustrate this new clause by the uh, CBN. What Listen, do you foresee? Let me... God, you know, there are always good people and bad people. I think that most people who are well-intentioned will go with it. Um, the BVN is not as easy to split because it's a unique identifier that goes with, like, your fingerprints. So it will be difficult but not impossible to find ways around it. So I am sure some people will look for ways around it. But I really believe that mostly it is going to work because... You've gone to a bank not because you enjoy credit. You've gone to a bank because you need credit. So people will still come to banks to take credit. And because you know, those who wanted to willfully not pay and default on their loans will find it more difficult. Because if you go to another bank, where you left the loan will have the right to pull your credit balances. So there is no doubt in my mind that this clause is going to reduce the default rate where loans are concerned, and it will encourage banks to do a bit more lending. What else do you think CBN, as a regulator, should be implementing right now? We have a bank recapitalization in the offing. We have this new initiative. We have your loan-to-deposit ratio. Any other loose ends? That you, you know, for us, we probably won't suggest anything. We're, you know, we're still trying to catch up with all the new ones. So I think the CBN is doing the right thing. I think they're moving along. Um, I think one thing we obviously have to crack, even from the perspective of the regulator, is we are doing retail credit, but we need to do more consumer-type credit. Well, thank you very much, uh, MDGT Bank. Thank you very much. I, ladies, I think we've enjoyed this conversation very have. much. And we want to thank, thank you. you. Thank we you know so how much. busy your schedule is. Thank you. So thank you very much. For thank, you so thank, you so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.